This is lesson 2.1, frequency distributions. A frequency distribution is simply a frequency table. There are typically two columns. Sometimes you will see more than two columns. The first column should include the class, and the class might be uh, ungrouped as it is here, A, B, C, D, F, which represents final grades in a statistics class. Or it could be a grouped frequency distribution where, for instance, I might have 91 to 100 for the A and 81 to 90 for a B and so forth. So either way, you're going to have the column that includes the class, which is grouped or ungrouped, and then you will have the frequency, which is typically just a count of how many times that um, data value or range of values occurs. You might sometimes see another column that is the relative frequency, but we will talk more about that in just a bit. We're going to start making some frequency distributions. We're going to do this by hand, but also using Excel. And many of the same questions that you must consider when you're creating a distribution by hand are the same questions you should consider using Excel. So the first question is, how many classes do you want in the distribution? Now, typically, we're going to tell you. So yes, it should be between 5 and 20, typically. Um, but in this class, we're going to say, use this many classes. Or we might instead tell you the bin width to use, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So here, if we're using five classes, and again, we're, this is data that's available to you. If you click the link below that has all of the Excel data, these are 3D TV prices in dollars in an ordered array. Ordered just means this is the lowest price, this is the highest price. So we are going to use five classes. The next thing that we should consider is what the class width will be. And I just called it bin width on our last slide, but it's the same thing. So a good place to start is to take the highest value, which was 1999, and the lowest value, which was 1595, and divide it by the number of classes you, you plan to use. So we knew we had to use five classes. If I do that division, I end up with a bin width or a class width of about 81. Now, there's nothing wrong with a class width of 81, but it just makes more sense to go in intervals of 100 instead, since we're dealing with $100 values. So I'm going to choose our class width to be 100. Then we need to find the class limits. Now here's something where Excel is going to find them for you. Now if we have to do this by hand, typically you're going to start with the smallest value. So our smallest value again was 1595. But since we're using a a bin width or a class width of 100, that would make 1595 to 1695, and then 1690, or sorry, 1694, and then 1695 to 1794. And that doesn't really make sense for us to do it in that way. Since we're using a nice whole number class width of 100, it makes much more sense to start at 1500 and then go to 1599. So if you'll notice the $100 difference is between those starting values. So a lot of people get confused by that and say 1500 to 1600 and then 1601 to 170 or 1700 and then 1701 and so forth. So just make sure that you understand that bin width um, is $100 and that's from the beginning of one to the beginning of the next. So now that we have our class width and we have our lower and upper boundaries, we are going to go ahead and make the frequency distribution by hand. And so it's very helpful that our array is already ordered for us. So 1595 and 1599 will be in our first class. And then we have one, two, three, four, five in our second class. And then one, two, three, four, in our third class, one, two, three, four, five in our fourth class, and one, two, three, four. Now typically, whoops, just four. Typically, we will have an unordered array, and so the tally process will be a little bit more important. Here, I could have skipped the tallies completely, 
and gone straight to 25454 simply because it was already ordered and I could quickly count those up in my head. Now that we know how to do this by hand, let's take a look at how to do it using Excel. In Excel, I have opened the data from the Chapter 2 data set, and the very first tab is 3D TV prices. So this is the data that I'm going to use. I'm going to go ahead and highlight the data first. Um, you don't have to do it that way. I just find it easier to do it in that way. And then I'm going to go to Insert, and I'm going to choose a pivot table. So I have sort of a, an abbreviated menu because I'm trying to make this small enough to fit on half of a slide. But if you'll notice, when I open up or when I choose a pivot table, the data that I've selected is already here in the input range. So that's the input, the data I want to analyze. If I hadn't pre-selected that data, I would have to click in the box and then select the data. Then I choose my output. So the output um, is default to new worksheet. If you choose new worksheet, it creates a brand new Excel worksheet for you. I don't want that. I want to choose an existing worksheet, the worksheet that I'm on, and notice I'm clicking in the location box, and then I'm going to click on the cell where I want the table to appear. So I'm choosing C1, and then click OK. Now if you'll notice, it doesn't do anything except give me some pivot table options. So if I look just at this pivot table, there is no pivot table. What I want to do is then take my data, so this is the 3D TV prices data, move it to rows and move it to values. Now, if you'll notice, often it comes up as sum of 3D TV prices or sum of whatever. I just need to click that down arrow and click on value field settings. I want the count because a frequency table is, or frequency distribution counts how often that value occurs. Now, before I continue, I do want to show you that if instead of count, I wanted a relative frequency, which we'll talk more about in a bit, I would just have to go to show values as and percent of grand total. I'm not going to do that now because all I want is just the count. So if I click OK, and then I click out of those options, if you'll notice, I have a frequency distribution but you might be thinking this isn't correct because it doesn't look like the one that we did by hand and you'd be right because what Excel does, because they only Excel only does what it tells us, what we tell it to, it has just said how many times does 1595 occur and 1599 and so on. And so what I have to do is any value in the left-hand column, if I right click and go to group, I'm going to choose the starting value, and that's where we have to be smart enough to know what is our starting value and what is our class width. So notice this is our class width. So I typically uncheck both boxes. I enter the value that I want for my first value. This one happens to work out that it is going to be 1999, and then it goes by 100. So I'm entering this value, I'm entering this value. I wouldn't necessarily have to put anything in there, and I'm going to click, oops, Apparently, yes, I do have to put something in there and click OK. So now it looks really good, but I have this or blank, which is kind of annoying. And so I'm just going to click on that down arrow and I want to get rid of the 1500 or blank. And if you'll notice now, it looks exactly like what we did by hand, but just a little bit neater because Excel has done it for us. Now that we know the basics of a frequency distribution, let's take a look at some other characteristics. So other things we might be asked to find or understand include a class boundary. And when we talk about class boundaries, we're really just talking about what is the very lowest and what is the very highest number that will go into our particular class. And really, it's not rocket science. We're just going to average the um, upper limit of one value or of one class and the lower limit of the next class. So for instance, in this example, I'm looking at 1599 to 1600. If I add those two values together and divide by two, I get 1599.5. That's the very last value that's going to go in my lower class and the first value of my upper class. And I just continue that for each of the other class boundaries.
There's also a class midpoint. And again, not rocket science. We're just going to take the lower value and upper value and average those, add them together, divide by two. So our midpoint is going to be 140, uh, I'm sorry, 1,549.5. And then the next one would be 1,649.5 and so on and so forth. Again, the midpoint um, is used to, for the average value of each class. So it's just finding, again, the mathematical average. And it can be useful. And often in Hawks, they will ask you to find that midpoint and even create your frequency table using that midpoint. Then there's the relative frequency. This is something you will use quite often. The relative frequency is the frequency, but relative to how many total values there are. So in order to do this, you're going to do the class frequency, which you'll sometimes see this as F, and then the sample size, which is N. N is always the sample size. And N would be the sum of how many um, values we have. So 2 plus 5 plus 4 plus 5 plus 4, which of course is 20. So in this case, we're looking at 20. So for each of these, I'm just going to take 2 over 20, which is going to give me 1 over 10 or 10%. 10 and then 5 over 20, 5 over 20, and let's just write these over to the side, 2 over 20, 5 over 20, which is 25%, 4 over 20, which is 20%. And again, how am I finding those? I'm just dividing 2 divided by 20, which gives me 0 0.1, which is 10%. 5 divided by 20, which is 0 0.25. Remember, we just moved the decimal twice, 25% and so on. Sorry if I skipped over that. And then same thing. So I get 20% and then 25% and then 20%. So one thing to keep in mind is the relative frequency should add up to 100%. If you're doing rounding, uh, for instance, say I had 16.67%, which I rounded to 17%, I might end up with something like a 99% if I had to round down often, or a 101% if I had to round up often, but typically it's going to be right there at that 100%. And the cumulative frequency, you're not going to use very often, but cumulative frequency just means all of the values up to that point. So for my first bin, it's going to be the exact same as the frequency. For my second bin, it's going to be 2 plus 5, which is 7. For my next bin, it's 2 plus 5 plus 4, which is 11. And then I'm adding the 5 to that, which is 16, and adding the 4 to that, which is 20. So if you'll notice, this value should always equal n, which is the sample size. This is just a great overview slide. I'm not going to go through step by step because we just did that, but this is everything that we've talked about with frequency distributions. Let's put together everything we've learned now in another example. So there is a tab in the same spreadsheet that we have been using called BU Miles. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a frequency distribution that includes the class boundaries, midpoint, relative frequency, and cumulative frequency of each class. And again, they are specifying for us to use six classes. So let's take a look. We're going to go through everything on the summary page together, and then we're going to create the distribution. I've copied the data to the bottom of this page for you so that we don't have to flip back and forth to determine the answers to these questions. For the first part, we are to find the number of classes. Now the question told us to use six. For the class width, notice this is not an ordered array. So we have to do just a little bit more work to come up with what is the largest value and what is the smallest value. And when I subtract 11.9 minus one and divide by six, which is the number of classes, I get about 1.8167, and it makes more sense to round that to two. Three is the class limits, so we'll start with one, which is the lowest value. Um, again, sometimes we start with the lowest value. If our lowest value was, say, 1.3 or 1.4, we would probably still start with one. So I'm going to start with one and use a class width of two. 
So again, that means this goes from 1, and then the next one starts at 3, so it's 1 to 2.9, 3 to 4.9, and so on. And how did I know to use 0.9 instead of, say, 0.95? Well, there's one decimal place on each of these values, so that's how far I go. And then for frequency, again, uh, I didn't make the whole frequency table. Um, I'm going to on the next page. But really, I was looking for how many were between 1 and 2.9. Well, there was 1 and oh, 2 and 3 and so on and so forth. So I just counted those up already. For the class boundaries, remember the class boundaries are if I average the 2.9 and the 3, I get 2.95, and then I get 4.95, and so on. For the midpoints, I am taking the lower limit and upper limit, 1 and 2.9, and adding those together and dividing by 2, so 1.95 is the midpoint. Relative frequency is just each of these values divided by 18, since there were 18 total data values, so n is 18. And then the cumulative frequency is 3, and then 3 plus 3, which is 6, and then 6 plus 4, which is 10, and so on. So putting it all together, we have a very large table that includes the classes, the frequencies, the class boundaries, the midpoints, the relative frequencies, and the cumulative frequencies. Let's recreate quite a bit of that display using Excel. So I'm going to highlight BU Miles and go to Insert Pivot Table. Again, this is where I can choose where I want the pivot table to be. I'm going to choose the existing worksheet and cell C, but I could also choose one of the different tabs, so keep that in mind for your unit project. I'm just going to choose cell C and click OK. That should bring up your pivot table fields. If it doesn't, just make sure that that field list button is highlighted. And then I'm going to go to BU Miles for rows. And then I'm going to do it three times because I want it to show the frequency, the relative frequency, and the cumulative frequency. So BU Miles, this first one, notice it's in sum. I don't want it to be sum. I want it to be count. And I'm just going to call it frequency. And notice it's given me now my frequency. Then for the second, same thing, value field settings, count, but I'm going to show values as a percent of the grand total, and that's going to be relative frequency. And again, for the last, I want that to be cumulative. So I'm going to go to value field settings, and I'm going to write cumulative, and I'm going to go to count and show values as, and this one requires you to scroll down a little bit, I want running total in. So notice I could use running total in or percent running total, which would give me the percentage. I'm just going to do the first one. And so now I have what I want. Oops, I forgot to change that to cumulative frequency. I thought I did, but apparently I didn't save that. So cumulative and OK. So now I'm going to right click on row labels and get rid of that blank. I don't want the blank one in there. And then I'm going to right click and I'm going to go to group. So remember with grouping I want to go by two. I'm going to start at one and go by two and click OK. Whoops, it showed that blank again so I'm going to get rid of it again. And now I have what I want. I've got my relative frequency. I've got, I'm sorry, my frequency my relative frequency, and for some reason my cumulative isn't working. Let's go fix that again. And I'm going to show values as percent, nope, as running total. There we go. And now we have everything that we need. Coming up next, we're going to take a look at how to display qualitative data.